Welcome to a very special episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I'm delighted to introduce you to Georgiana Laudi, co-founder and CEO of consulting agent firm, Forget the Funnel, and the author of Forget the Funnel, with tons of experience, including being a VP of marketing at Unbounce. Georgiana, or Gia, as we're going to refer to you, the call. welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. You had me on Forget the Funnel, because I have some issues with the forcing people into, into being a, a lead and some kind of terminology that moves you away from being a, a human or a customer or future customer to being kind of part of uh, some sort of uh, factory. And so I'd love to hear where did Forget the Funnel, a vision come from, and kind of what do you hate about the funnel? Yeah. So in essence, we find the the funnel a sort of lazy way of thinking about customers also uh, problematic, particularly now, given that our relationships with our customers are so important. So when we think about our relationships with customers in this sort of flattened, simplistic, generic sort of way, like a funnel, we lose all kinds of opportunities to create better experiences and more value, deliver more value and increase conversions overall. So funnels are just lazy and particularly problematic if you are, you know, serving a uh, a recurring revenue business, right? If you're working, if the business model is B2B SaaS or any sort of recurring revenue model, thinking about your relationship with your customers as being a funnel is highly problematic because obviously bottom of funnel is when somebody becomes a customer and there's a whole lot that happens after that for recurring revenue businesses. The other thing too, is that a lot of context is often missed when we think about our relationship as being part of a funnel. When we think about the sort of world that our customers are living in before they even know that we exist as they're experiencing the problem that we help them solve that context when they're out in the world experiencing that problem and dealing with the old way and that process of deciding that something's got to change i need a new way to do this i can't live like this anymore most funnels most customer journeys and models like that don't take that into account and that's really critical context to understand about our customers if we're going to adequately market to them reach them resonate with them and then ultimately turn them into high ltv very happy customers for the long term so again funnels flatten our view highly problematic make assumptions about our relationships with customers and their relationship with our product and also leave out a lot of really important context pre acquisition out in the world but also post acquisition in terms of continued value and expansion and all the wonderful world of recurring revenue businesses yeah. that yeah. i know you also are part of as well yeah and i would just echo that and i would say what 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 bothers me about this is also the oversimplification simplification of the real uh, B2B buyer journey, totally. which does not feel at all linear to me, right? It feels more like quantum physics type of experience <laughs> where you're bouncing and going forward. And, and then you obviously have people in the buyer group that have very different levels of knowledge that are required, whereas this sort of, mm -hmm. this implies that there's one person going through somehow getting more and more interested. And I wish we all had an individual customer that's going to go and buy Three enterprise steps. deals. Like that's a dream, right? Let's, yeah. if we find that muscle talk, right, let's bring yeah. it on. But in my view, that's very far from reality where you have different people yeah. that have different needs. That's and right. even the same person, uh, you catch them, for example, at a different time in the buyer journey will need obviously different information. But he also, they could be in the evening looking at this um, of the information in their phone, or they could be like, they have maybe time, but like not the screen, or they're like super intent and in answering a very specific question to move this along. So you need to give the user the flexibility to also self-identify them and pick where they want to be in the journey. And I, I, don't, I don't know if the funnel supports that metaphor. No, not at all. That's right. It it flattens 
our view. And so we end up creating experiences that are void of that nuance and that context. It's really important to have that understanding where it's a perfect example of where is somebody making a decision? What is the context in which they're making a decision? And one example that comes to mind for me was a company that we worked with a little while ago where their customers were literally in their vehicles needing to find a solution. So they were experiencing the problem that this company that we were working with helped them solve, which was an invoicing tool. Um, there was a lot of assumptions around how somebody would come about needing an invoicing tool. And the what we actually learned by um, learning from those customers was that these folks were literally sitting in a vehicle at on site, on a job site, searching for this solution. And so we wouldn't have known that, we wouldn't have had that level of nuanced understanding and context and literally, physically, literally where they were making a decision, let alone what was going on in their mind, what they were comparing that this solution to and what they needed to see in order to make a purchase decision. So there's just a lot of layers available to us, layers, layers of sort of nuance and context about our customers that are actually available to us. We don't need to flatten our view of yeah. our customers. And we can obviously reap the benefits of providing a better customer experience than we were before, but also in comparison to the other options in the market, right? And, and I think the other part that you highlighted that based this word flattening, it almost feels like it uh, dehumanizes the full picture totally. of the buyer. Yeah. And so people use these words persona, right? Which look, it's better than not having anything, right? As, as a prototype, prototypical customer, but just the, when you start overusing these things in a, it, it feels not great. The salespeople pick up that terminology and they're the suspect prospect, right? And again, it's good maybe as a philosophy, but I think there's something that gets lost in the language totally. uh, that we forget that these are human beings. They have a career making decisions ahead of them. And we want to build trust to not, mm -hmm. and yeah, filtering yeah. is part of this. I don't know if thoughts are on that. Like how do you see marketing handle I, that challenge? I think you're highlighting a really important reason on how we got here. And I think that part of how we got here is this need to create a shared language around our customers or for our customers among like cross-functional teams. That's a mm. very real need. I think the problem is that over time, and I'm not sure what the genesis of this was, but I imagine it's at the end of the day, it's revenue probably, is that we think of our customers through the lens of their value to us and their value to the business versus the value that we're providing to them. And I think this is inherently like philosophically what is backwards about how we operationalize our customer experience. And that's that's why we do what we do. It's why we came up with this customer-led growth framework as a way yeah. to flip the script and operationalize our relationship with our customers through the lens of how we're delivering value to customers and what is the most appropriate experience for them. So we're not talking about lead or you know prospect or lead or MQL, SQL. We're talking about first value promise, value realization, continued value, things like that. And we develop our measures of success as well where our teams are able to understand based on these like leading indicators of success or these KPIs on how good of a job are we doing at helping our customers get from one milestone to the next in their relationship with us, not when do they become an MQL or an SQL, which is void of meaning. And it's just as problematic as prospect and lead. Yeah. Um, so that that's the whole that's the whole reason why we, why Forget the Funnel exists. That's the sort of genesis yeah. of where we came from. But I think you just connected the dots between this need of team for teams to have that shared language and shared understanding of that customer journey, which has to be there. We have just fallen into this trap of thinking about their value to the business, these transactional moments yeah. of success versus experiential moments of success. I think you nailed it. Like it's, and it's, you, you could see the difference. You meet some enterprise sales, like world-class enterprise sales teams. And they are a lot, like a lot of focus is on value. Yes, they need to close the deals, but they, the language is about customer value, like customer value realization. So I feel like almost sometimes in the sales organizations that are building long-term sustainable multi-year relationship versus just trying to push some skew across to make the quarter. There's a lot of work, right? And some of our clients that come from that world, 
They create value report for the customer at the end of the year where they bring together all the projects and everything. And it feels beautiful. It's a real marketing at its best production mm -hmm. where you show and demonstrate the value you've contributed and the, the, how to extend that forward. And mm -hmm. I somehow feel that the marketing gets stuck a little bit. The marketing is a guide, guide me on this. They get stuck in these overproduced case studies that nobody who's like half awake and some de share some degree of cynicism would really believe. So they're like, they feel they're faking it in some areas and then not doing enough of the, the real substantive kind of val value indication of like, hey, here's a real success. I'm catching this right. What are, what are the trends that you're seeing uh, and how they're changing over time? Yeah, what you just described the department or function within a business that popped into my head was like, there's no product marketing. And when I say product marketing, the true meaning of product marketing. So a lot of marketing teams are focused on their targets. And a lot of marketing teams are tasked with a lead number, right? They just, yeah. they have these performance targets and they need to generate a certain amount of leads. And so they get stuck in this trap of just the hamster wheel of what do we need to do month over month to produce more leads and doubling down on things that have worked in the past and just throwing spaghetti at the wall. A lot of times that happens a ton where we're just like desperate to show results. And so we need yeah. to put anything out into the world so that we see cheap revenue officer, not bust our jobs for not right. having enough leads. Basically that's the fundamental yeah, traffic and number one yeah, completely. yeah, traffic and leads. And so as long as those numbers are, are going up, then we know that we've done our job and it's void of, like you said, that's the deeper story, the deeper analysis of what is going on there. And I think that a lot of product marketing teams are largely underutilized or non-existent where actually, if you can think about it as product marketing as a function, maybe not as a yeah. department or a role, but to, product marketing as a function is really meant to think about that foundational sort of understanding that foundational, what is the forest for the trees? Who yeah. is our ideal customer? What do they really care about? That psychographic understanding of customers and then that therefore tied back to really solid positioning that yeah. supports yeah. amazing messaging and that ultimately supports a better sort of strategy that gets layered on top of that that related to not only product experiences and sales experiences, but obviously content and things like that. So yeah, yeah. I think that the fundamentals are often missing. There's a lot of reasons why the fundamentals are missing, largely because I said, I think product marketing is an, a misunderstood function within many SaaS businesses. This is true in product-led organizations, probably even more so in sales-led organizations. I think product marketing is wildly underutilized and, and misunderstood. It has a world of value to provide, especially inside of sales-led orgs. But also, I think marketing teams are running a little bit scared right now, especially mm. in tech. There's tons of layoffs happening. It's been a really volatile few years for marketing. Mm -hmm. There's been lots of layoffs. I was just looking at recently the hiring I think the there were about I think it was 260,000 tech jobs were were lost last year and it is not really 2024 is shaping up to be pretty similar we're yeah. on, on track to hit about yeah. the same number and I think a lot of marketing teams have long that's an an additional sort of exasperation of the problem but even before that problem existed there has always been I, in tech, my opinion, and you may or may not share this, I think a, a gross misunderstanding, not only of product marketing, but of marketing overall, especially yeah. in tech, because marketing is, tech companies are not typically launched and started by people with marketing backgrounds. Yeah. So there's often a misunderstanding of the value of marketing. There's also often a overestimation of what marketing is capable of, a misunderstanding and, and unfair sort of targets put on marketing's head there's they're often among the lowest paid company people in companies especially mm. at tech companies what's often happening is that these sort of mid career or or less experienced marketers are being tasked with like c suite level targets and so they're there's this sort of disconnect between marketers in tech and like the actual tech companies and the leadership teams that they work for. And that's actually like going even further back. That's actually where Forget the Funnel came from was that misalignment of marketing and tech and the, the misunderstanding between yeah. leadership teams and marketing. And so there's the misunderstanding of marketing. Everybody's a marketing expert because everybody's marketed too. And so lots of people are. Yes, that is the, that is a big 
thing Huge that we problem. notice, right? Every sales rep is a marketer you totally. know, waiting to be uncovered. And, the, and then these poor yeah. marketers are also underpaid. Yeah. And they have very little, often little, too little social capital internally to get people on board and in alignment, let alone like product teams or sales teams or the leadership team. And so there's this terrible, just self-fulfilling prophecy happening inside of a lot of marketing teams. And so I think that is a big reason why marketing teams fall into this trap of marketing for marketing's sake, spaghetti at the wall type of marketing, yeah. guesswork, guesswork layered on top of guesswork, experimentation for the sake of experimentation. And they're missing the forest for the trees and wasting a lot of time because ultimately at the end of the day, if we can go to the source, if we can go to our amazing customers yeah. and have a yeah. couple really meaningful targeted conversations with them, we can understand at so in so much more of a rich, nuanced way, how to serve them, how to talk to them, what they need in their customer yeah. experience, right? What solution they're firing in order to hire ours. A lot of marketers get that wrong. We so let's double click on the types of marketers because you started going into yeah. like content, demand gen and product. And I, I think this is helpful. And I just want to say some of my best friends are marketers and I used to be a marketer. <laughs> And I made all the mistakes, I'm sure, Me that we're too. talking Me too. about, right? So, <laughs> so yeah. like, this is was all the humility that's required. And I love us, uh, like some of our customers and my other pet would relate to our marketers. And I think ultimately, every, like, the world is moving towards that every great business person needs to be a lot savvier marketer. So I think the sales rep of the future needs to have a marketing mind a lot more than they used to. And any, like an HR professional need to be a savvy communicator as the best of marketers. So I think let's say if you think this is a marketing topic, I think it's a product marketing it's a topic. Uni it's a universal, everybody has a product that's a quote unquote, that's got to be marketed. And then so let's, yeah. but marketers may run into some, I think, traps. So we talk like so they demand gen top of the funnel. So the trap trap is you know, fake numbers, fake kind of MQL, Vanity. marketing qualified, yeah. pseudo sales qualified, feed it in, all customers are equal, right? Like mm -hmm. that sort of is one trap and it's a typically high volume approach that ends up everybody's feeling spammy. And, and it's very costly. Spammy, and it's costly because you're more costly ads, than it was yeah. before. Costly it's harder nothing and harder. Is working, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you with Gen AI, it's even going to be hard. Like the, maybe oh. the cost of content is going to break down. I am we're already bombarded by these messages where people think they copy your title, and they think they got personalization going right. And it's just ah, come on. So it's if the goal of the marketer at the top of the funnel is to make a great first impression, they're either shoving and so if they're doing content content results, hey, they're shoving stuff that doesn't look attractive, doesn't engage. We're talking about that. It has its own problems, or they're just spamming or spamming or doing both. They're putting not an attractive first foot forward and doing it in a very high volume way. And so that feels like one obvious mess up. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's six things in what you just said, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> there's yeah, a lot right. of problems like, in I there. Just, I tried to aggregate it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like the people in the content marketing, which is... I love the idea that, and I think parts of it is thought leadership, so it's, but I think there's something that happened where it feels like content marketing serves the demand gen part of the organization oftentimes. And so they're being asked to do some of the nastiest, ugliest things, serve up this SEO spammy garbage that you wouldn't, if you really had a good customer, you would be embarrassed if they mm -hmm. looked at it half the time, right? So it's like volume approach to play the SEO game or sometimes repeatable me too, you know, outputs that don't like, they're not really digestible. And so I feel yeah. like they're, they're serving the wrong gods almost, right? And they're like stuck and they can't lead because they don't have the authority in most organization. Like mm -hmm. there's not that a ton of like SVP of content marketing. There's always like director, or maybe VP at the max, but there, yeah. this is, what do you think about what's going on in that relationship? So I, there's so much in what you just said. And I think that at the foundational sort of level of it is that nobody is in charge of that holistic yeah. 30,000 foot view of the customer experience. And 
I, I go back to product marketing because oftentimes when product marketing is leveraged well, it should, that function should be able to provide the awareness marketers, the demand gen marketers, the content marketers, or the con- I, I have trouble just conflating content with marketing naturally because content is applicable across the customer yeah, experience. Yeah. So I, I don't yeah. even like to say content marketing because content is wider Everything. scope yeah, than that. Yeah. But if we think about it in terms of there's an end-to-end customer experience, like I described, right? There's somebody out in the world experiencing the problem that you solve. Then that person discovers that you exist. They decide to, in some capacity, take some sort of leap of faith in order to really discover more about you. Either they're booking a demo call or they're signing up for a free product for your free trial or whatever it is. And then they go through an evaluation phase where they are really going through the motions of like, where are our deal breakers and anxieties? And is this going to actually serve the problem? And am I? what other buyers do I need to involve, especially in a B2B scenario? All the way through to okay, hallelujah, this thing is going to solve my problem, which we refer to as value realization, but it is some sort of, somebody hits a critical sort of threshold of value with your experience. And then we move into growth phase. And in the growth phase, we've got that continued value because again, recurring revenue businesses, but we also have ways that your customers will evolve and grow in their usage of your product. And so you might think about referral mechanisms. Are you saying that product marketer can do all that? Wait, I, I'd like so, to meet that person. Whoever so she is, I'm, is it you? Or is it, <laughs> yes, this is what we do. I'm, this I'd be very impressed because yeah. I can tell you, I was this like- This is what product sorry. marketing does. This is what product marketing can it, do. It and can, I wouldn't what even it say- can do. What it yes. can do. And I already, you're right, there are examples, but man, my oh my, I put myself in the shoes of former consultants straight out of Stanford B school, like doing marketing, product marketing, and I was still like, was knowing all the good stuff I'm supposed to do, like mm-hmm. you still gravitate to feature functiony stuff, the demo stuff, and you pull, yeah. try to pull up there, but you yeah. gravitate towards that. You're ha- happy to support an enterprise, in an enterprise in particular, you're like happy when our sales rep gets to ask you for help. But I think what I struggle with as a like marketers, unless they are like industry marketers or solution marketers type of product marketers, right? They tend to be like they take the word product very seriously and they get stuck in the product part of the component. And that's you know, most sales organizations push you a little bit towards that as well. You got sales engineers to support, etc. Am I what am I missing? Is there like a new breed of product marketers that surpass that? Like, where do they live? Show us the companies. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. By the way, I just muted myself because there's some noise outside. So apologies for the background noise. They've decided to do their, their landscaping next door. So yes, absolutely. That product marketing is, like I said, I think largely underutilized and misunderstood okay. inside inside of organizations. Because I'm not saying that a product marketer is responsible for executing an implementation and the strategy for that end to end customer experience. What I'm saying is that product marketing is responsible for learning what the customer needs, getting intimately familiar with the ideal customer yeah. and their needs the milestones and the major decision-making points and critical leaps of faith that your customers take in your relationship with you and taking all of that information and disseminating it to the rest of the team, whether or not is to it is to the marketing department or the demand gen functionality or the sales. content team yeah, so. or the product team or the product marketing or the sales team. It, product marketing, whether you call it that or not, does or whether that's the title of the individual responsible for that end-to-end customer experience, Their job is getting intimately familiar with your amazing customers and then educating and facilitating the rest of the company to create amazing customer experiences that layer into that. And that's exactly what we do. That's what the customer-led growth framework is meant to do. So we leverage jobs to be done research in order to get a psychographic and demographic understanding of our customer's relationship with us. And then we basically operationalize that in a customer experience map where we're saying, okay, there are these critical moments of value that our customers need to experience in our relationship with us. And then each of those milestones, we can unpack what somebody is thinking, feeling, and doing so that we really understand what do they need at this moment. And then with that understanding across all of those milestones, we know we can reverse engineer their experience and, and at what does good look like for them? How did they experience the, the product and what was going on in, in their mind so that we can then look at the customer experience that we're delivering 
and yeah. see all of the ways that what we're doing today might be out of alignment with that. And so we can that identify. That feels like a product manager to me, a lot more than a product a marketer. Product manager? Unfortunately, unfortunately. But like I think of the Well, DNA that's why the title's not important. Know. Yeah. But, I, and I think it, it is, yeah, I'm mean, with you on the, what you're describing feels, feels le- a lot more customer like, experience leader. And it's like oftentimes yep. almost the CEO or, or somebody very senior who could steer, could, could steer and then have that intimate knowledge like of connecting the dots. Yeah, you definitely um, need senior sponsorship yeah, to get something yeah. like this done. For sure, you've got to have buy-in at the yeah. executive level to do this type of work because it impacts so many departments. So yeah. if you're at a larger company, you have to have that. At smaller companies, though, no, this is absolutely something that could be done. Yes, it could be by a product manager or product owner, or it could be somebody that, we may, again, title is not important, but the yeah. function of product marketing is really what I'm leaning into here. Because yes, it's about the product experience, but more so than just the product experience, it's about the customer experience layer you're putting on top of yeah. that. So okay. your positioning, your messaging, the emails, the the product experience, the sales experience, the, the sales materials and collateral, yeah. the product experience experience itself, how you introduce the product in what order, those types of things, customer marketing also in the sort of post-acquisition and growth phase, all of that sort of intel about your customers needs to be thought about in a holistic way, but then communicated back and, and brought back to the team to his, who are actually responsible for creating those experiences. Got it. And so what we so, have found is that yep. operationalizing that view really enables teams to make way better decisions and they don't have to guess. So these marketing teams, they don't have to guess anymore. They have that, that deep intel about what is going on with their customers out in the market. They know how to go and meet them. They know what those watering holes are. They know what their anxieties are. The sales team understands where they are in the buying journey and what they need along the way, who's involved in that process, because we've got that deep intel. And I could go on and on and on about the rest of the customer experience. But again, it's a tool for teams to make better decisions and remove the need for guesswork. It's just not necessary. I think it's super interesting. I think some of the interesting tension that that, that it kind of bringing up is I commented a little bit from the world of enterprise trying to be more customer centric, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And you come at it probably a lot more from a product led growth world yep. where it is like product marketer is actually a stronger, That's more right. influential function. You know, 100%. God pity those product marketers in the enterprise thing. That's like their first people oftentimes to in this recession world to be yes. pressured. They don't have budgets. They're not, mm-hmm. you know, I had to beg with, with, the, with all my creds and everything, get to beg to go to customer call. I still remember that because I think it like- Which, you, Yes, you, blows my mind. It's Why? kind of crazy. Yeah. But I think the, so there's a still different kind of enterprise mindset of don't mess with me. You can, see you can call it a customer experience. Yeah. You, yeah. I think you're yeah. right. That yeah. again, the title's not important. If it's somebody in customer, the, at the end of the day, is somebody thinking about the customer experience holistically and responsible for understanding what customers, what ideal customers, that's really important. Yeah. Not all customers yeah. are created equally. How to yeah. think about segmentation and how to get that intel back to the rest of the teams. Somebody has got to be responsible for doing that. Whether or not you call that a customer experience, head of customer experience or head of product marketing really doesn't matter. But in my experience, product marketing does think, does think in that way. That's right. And in sales led organizations, product marketers are often tasked with producing sales collateral, which is a wild under undervaluing of the role because product marketers are in a great position to do customer research and understand your, the, your unique differentiators out in the market, the positioning out in the market, they pay attention to what's going on out in the world. They intimately understand your customers and then they can connect the dots for the team to create those experiences. So I think you're right. And again, at the end of the day, I, I, titles, I don't care. Well, Just we've got a lot, like, I think what the important work. thing is we found a lot of issues in the current marketing process yeah. to uncover, whatever the title. So yeah. let's, like you several times, you brought up something that's near and dear to many of our listeners, which is content, right? So mm-hmm. it's content, like first impression that comes from content and demand gen team that's yeah. trying to get my awareness. Yeah. And are they building trust or are they turning me off and feeling spammy? Then you brought up like uh, product marketers creating, like it or not, they are doing the demo experiences and are doing uh, sales collateral. That's the first sales impressions. And I think there's a lot of statistics out there from our friends at Gartner 
that say that you know eighty percent of the customer journey is completed before you talk to sales yes. organization, right? So what have you found with your clients, right? And maybe we can divide from PLG to product led sales type of folks. What are the kind of the the fall? Where do people fall down when it comes to content typically? Oh, that's a great question. So I would say in the majority of, so I would have to split up product-led companies versus sales-led versus product-led sales, because those are very, three very different scenarios and how you leverage content or how you make decisions about what content you would layer in would be well, very let's different. Let's focus on product-led sales and, and, okay. and, and sales, right? Like sales-led. Okay. For a product-led sales, in a product-led sales situation, I would say that less content is needed during the, so content is needed out for awareness level marketing. But when we get into that sort of beginning of the evaluation phase, I don't think content is quite needed so much because the product itself, the product, the product needs to speak for itself. But if you consider email onboarding content, which I do, there's content needed there, right? So in a product-led scenario where you're relying on the product to help somebody self-qualify for booking a demo or using the product in an interesting way. So you might be leveraging a sandbox account, or you might have some sort of product environment that you allow your customers to kick the tires in where they then self-qualify up to opt-in for sales. They become a hand raiser for sales. In that scenario... 70% of people who log into a product for the first time never come back again. They need coffee. They get hungry. They go to sleep. There's like a gajillion things that yeah. can stand in their way. And if you are not leveraging email to help them come get back into the product, remind them why they even Sign came to you in the first place, place right? right? Yeah. And support Give them, them with like content. Nudge. Hey, good job. You got started here. Like here's how anything. You it depends on, it depends what, it depends on your product and your customer, obviously. But I see far too many companies that are, especially in a product led sales motion or in a just purely sales motion where they're leveraging the product in some way, where they're giving companies an opportunity or prospects an opportunity to kick the tires in, in their product, but they're not leveraging email because if they log out, they're never coming back again. You, your okay. product, you can't send in app. The funnel to summarize, stop of the funnel need to get yeah. them in continue yeah. engagement during the trial and then what after, the, after, after the onboarding that's probably a lot because there's probably a lot that's tons still not tons done, you could do right? like, and, and then obviously interested. yeah the onboarding all the way through to reaching value realization obviously there's some higher assist motions than others it depends on on what your customers need what is the yeah. most appropriate experience for them that's the answer to your questions like on how to leverage content yeah. what do, how much do they need how much for the different buyers that are involved? And then really interesting where content gets paid should be brought in again is in that sort of post acquisition, continued value expansion, monetization. There's a ton of content marketing. Very situation. little though. Yeah, I agree. That is probably so what, the biggest. What about sales led? Sales led. What are the yeah, well, two big I, problems? I would say that applies to a sales led environment. Just the difference is that the evaluation phase, there's an assist there, but yeah. there is oftentimes an opportunity to. Um, leverage, I'll say programmatic communications, but I want to just stick a little asterisk there that I recognize that programmatic communications, especially in the world that we are living in right now with AI is a big problem. And I'm not talking about just leveraging, you, you mentioned before personalization being like swapping in like a name or a title that is not personalization, yeah. um, but leveraging programmatic in a meaningfully segmented way, I mm. think is definitely an oversight of, of a lot of sales led orgs where they think that it's a one-to-one -one only, but there is actually often a product experience that can be layered in and that can support sales. And I think a lot of product marketing teams and marketing teams could better support sales by providing them with more better materials. But I can't say what those materials are because it completely depends on your customers. It depends on the industry and the, 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 exactly. the sophisticated. If you go into cybersecurity, people want self like content that they consume on their own versus totally. talking to the reps, That's right? right? And other industries, yep. people want more touch. But on 100%. the whole, I would say, mm -hmm. and I'm curious what your challenge is, on this is that the world is moving towards I uh, don't give me a sales meeting, but yes. I like but but give me the quality of a sales meeting that's right on my time in my place that I can share with my team. 
That's right. Without overwhelming me necessarily, but if I'm interested, I want to be able to drill in. Uh, is that That's kind of- 110, okay. yeah. I think that double clicking on that, I think there's a, a, a real huge opportunity there for even- complex uh, products and complex industries, let alone those that have an, a, a bit of an aversion to sales, which there are many industries mm -hmm. that have that, or I shouldn't say industries, individuals type of buyers, mm -hmm. right? Depending on the job to be done and the profile of the, of the individual, I think you, you highlighted a really obvious one, developers, any sort of technical buyer, they don't want to talk to sales. They just... Yeah. Give me the information I need and get out of my way. <laughs> and yeah. so we work with actually a lot of dev tools that need to and want to leverage programmatic communication to enable those technical buyers to, to see value, reach first value before putting them in a situation where they need to, to talk to sales. And I'm not saying that every enterprise or sales led type of product needs to be leveraging product, a product led growth sort of model, but there is always an opportunity to, there's always an opportunity to, to layer in a more, to leverage your product more. I think the biggest challenge is figuring out how to do that without a upsetting the sales team, which happens yeah. a lot. It's a huge deterrent for a lot of companies is often their head of sales was the, the best man at their wedding. Yeah. That's a hard pill to swallow. There's a lot there. That's an episode on it. On That's the next homework. episode. Gia, yeah. this has been tremendous. I think people yeah may forget the funnel after we talk, but they will never forget this conversation if they got to this part. Where yeah. can they find you, uh, yeah. engage with you, and uh, dig in more of this brilliant content that you shared with us today? Yeah, totally. Look, the easiest thing to do, if you're interested in the process and you're interested in learning more, we wrote a short, succinct, very practical book. We were very deliberate in writing a short practical book. So the book is called Forget the Funnel. It runs through this framework from beginning to end. So you can figure out very easily whether or not it's something you think could work for, for your team. And yeah, I would definitely recommend checking out the book. There's also a workbook that goes along with it for anybody who wants to have a go at doing it on their own, which you absolutely can. And if you're in a situation where you're like, nope, we don't want to do this ourselves and we want somebody to do it more quickly, then you could always get in touch with us forgetthefunnel.com and we can chat and see if there's a fit. Brilliant. So thank you so much for sharing your insights. Wrestling was this problems we it's have. It's a in big marketing. topic. <laughs> yeah. And customer centricity yeah. across the board yeah. near and dear to our hearts. And I hope folks got a bunch of nuggets like I did from this conversation. Thanks so much, Jim. Thanks for having me.